Welcome. I'm Carl Frederick, and I will be interviewing individuals for Kenosha Voices, an oral history project of the Kenosha County Historical Society in conjunction with Kenosha Community Media. I have worked in newspapers for more than 40 years as an editor and a reporter. 38 and a half of those years were at the Kenosha News. I am also a member of the Kenosha County Historical Society Board. We hope you enjoy these programs. I'm speaking with Chuck Roberts, a longtime ski instructor at Willamont Mountain and author of a book summarizing the history of the mountain. Welcome, Chuck. How are you doing today? Very good. Yourself? Well, I am fine. Thank you. When did you start working for Wilmot Mountain? I started in 1976 with my wife uh, as an instructor there in that season. And you still do that yet today? Yes, almost, I do. Almost 50 years. Uh, that's right, about 46 years to be exact. Okay. Why did you write a book about Wilmot Mountain? Well, I was talking with uh, the co-director of the ski school back in those days, about 1999 uh, or so. And uh, we decided, you know, there was a lot of history to this hill and that we had a lot of good photos and a lot of good stories. So we decided to write the book. Okay. And when was that book finished? It was finished around 2001, approximately. And the title of the book was? The title of the book is called Matterhorn of the Midwest. Okay. And uh, these are available at the, uh, uh, at the museum there. And it's also available online. Okay. Can you briefly tell me the history of Wilmot Mountain, just in general terms about how the hill itself developed and um, how some of the things um, made it what it is today? Well, it started in 1938 with Walter Stopa, who was a local architect in Chicago, and he wanted to get a ski area near, well, uh, near Chicago. And he came across Wilmont Hills, and they were about roughly about an hour and a half drive from Chicago, and they looked pretty good for a ski run. So he started a rope tow there, one rope tow, a warming hut, and put out the word, and he didn't think anybody was going to come, but apparently a bunch of people showed up, and that started it all. Did he have to buy the, the hill, or did he rent it from somebody? He rented it from Charles Pagel, a, a local resident in that area, farmer. And Charles would uh, let him use it for the ski runs. And he rented it until about the mid-50s, where he purchased it then. Mr. Pagel would uh, often uh, charge people from going to the ski hill. Basically so, the park? Yes. And uh, what you had to watch out for is you were charged per person and people would get in the trunk of the car to hide so that they could get more people in at less cost. And consequently, you got very good at looking how the cards set. If they were <laughs> setting pretty low in the back, the chances are there were people back there and you inspected the trunk. <laughs> I imagine he did catch some people now and again. Oh, all the time. Okay. So when uh, Mr. Stopa started developing the hill, and you said uh, in 38, the first weekend brought a surprising number to him, um, what was there? How many runs did it have? It had roughly one or two runs near the state line border with one rope toe. Okay. And then he uh, developed the hill further? Was there a lodge? Uh, did he develop it that way? Yes. Uh, he, uh, in the 40s, he added um, uh, uh, four more rope toes. And of course, the war years were, were a little bit tough because it's hard to get fuel to run the tractor that ran the rope toes. But nevertheless, uh, it progressed. And in 1947, the hill became uh, listed in the skier's guide for 1947 and okay. developed a ski school and a ski patrol in that decade in the 40s. Okay. All right, so the, 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 during that first winter of 38, they actually did have somebody teaching. Yes, they did. They had Helmut Teichner, who was a Chicago Sears executive that was a skier, and he formed uh, ski clubs in that area, and he was the head of the Ski Meisters Ski Club from Chicago. 
Okay, and that was the first club uh, associated with Wilmot at that time? Yes, it was. Okay. So basically we saw some development in the forties and by the end of that decade, uh, what was on the hill? How many runs? How... It was approximately five, uh, roughly four or five runs, five rope toes. And um, as the, uh, uh, as we entered the decade of the fifties, there was still a little bit of a stagnant growth to the ski area because of the lousy weather conditions. So oh, weather was a big factor of trying to get this thing to go. Oh, absolutely. Can you imagine waiting for a, a snowstorm and then open up quickly before the next rain hit? It was very difficult. And as it went into the, uh, the 50s, started with some better weather and what are other things uh, happened at Wilmot Mountain? Well, a significant thing was that Walter traveled to New York to look at a snow making system. And uh, he liked it and purchased it. That was an early bullhorn sprinkler, sprinkler design, looked like the one you had in your lawn. And that uh, would tend to freeze up and nevertheless form enough of snow that made the area viable. Then he quickly got a tripod mounted snow gun from the TEY company and it did very well. And this made Wilmot a viable enterprise because now you can make the snow after the rain and have skiing in the following weekend. Do they use the snowmaking machine to establish an initial base on the hill or do they wait for snow to, to come and create that base? Oh no, they, they usually would uh, put the snow right on when it was cold enough outside and keep piling it on as much as they could. Okay. And uh, also we saw some other things, some uh, advantages or some public publicity for the hill. That's right. There was um, lighting was added so you could ski at night and that was a big deal. And the early NBC night show featured Wilmont on the radio uh, with Herb Cups in it as the host. And he was quite a uh, enthusiastic uh, promoter of the ski area. Okay. And later that decade, they also raced cars? Yes, they did. Um, and uh, also Irv, by the way, Irv Cuffson did have a, a late night TV broadcast on that show called Nation at Night. And this was live broadcast of skiers skiing at Wilmot, which was the first of the US. And then during the summer months, there'd be car racing on the flat areas of Wilmot, the paths around there. And that was uh, quite popular. Put on by the, by the How long did that last? Oh, that uh, lasted probably five to, to eight years. Okay. And that was put on by the Milwaukee region of the Sports Car Club of America. Okay. And mostly small sports cars like MGTDs, MGTC, Singers, uh, cars of that type. Okay. And as we move to the 60s, what do we see at Wilmot Mountain? In the 60s, Walter decided to put in a chairlift and everybody thought he was out of his mind. But after installing the chairlift, the skiers loved it. And toward the end of the decade, two more were added. Okay, and uh, this brought further development, more runs. That is correct, more runs additional chairs, as we had mentioned, the snow making improved quite a bit. And practice ski mats were out there pre-season so you could practice your skiing prior to the, to the uh, season. And the sports car uh, races and bicycle races became a big hit in the summertime. Okay. And how many runs did we have by the end of the 60s? Oh, there's probably at least five or six runs that were available. So at its peak, how many runs were on the mountain? Oh, I would say probably 11 or 12 runs, approximately so. Okay. And that continues today? Yes. And they kept adding chairlifts as well? They, they did kept adding chairlifts, uh, a total of roughly about eight chairlifts until recent years when Vail Associates purchased the property in 19, excuse me, in 2016, 
then uh, one one of the chairlifts was removed removed and another one was upgraded with a quad type of chairlift to carry more people oh okay okay now you, uh, we mentioned the ski instruction began that first winter with uh, one instructor you know? correct okay and let's talk about how the ski instruction grew over the time from that one ski instructor through the decades. How, how did this uh, instruction work? How many people were interested in learning to ski? Well, the, uh, Helmut Teichner was the first instructor, and he was teaching the Alberg method of skiing, which means upper body rotated quite a bit so you could turn the skis. The skis at the time were long, the boots weren't very stiff, they were ankle high, so you had to do this in order to make the turn. And then um, as it progressed into the 40s, uh, more members joined the ski school. I think it was uh, Jim Nelson and Tommy Tyndall joined, and they were still teaching the Alberg method at the time. And when then, did that change? Uh, it changed probably in the 60s, about... Uh, Oh, I would say uh, in, in the 1960s or 50s to 60s, there was a change to the more the Austrian method where you uh, stood up more on your skis, but you had a counter rotation and you skied counter uh, to the direction of travel. And then finally, in the uh, 60s or 70s, the American teaching method was used where the upper body was more stationary facing down the hill. And it's the lower body that did all the work. And with the improvement of equipment, I imagine that became easier to use those different methods. Oh, absolutely. The American teaching method worked very well with the short skis, the short hour glass skis that were, that were developed in the 90s. And the bindings were better as well? That very much so. The, the ASTM committee, that's American Society Teaching uh, Testing Materials Committee, I actually developed um, the DIN method of release, so you could set the release setting according to your weight, height, and ability. And, and that worked they, out very well. And, and that would disengage you from the skis when you fell. So you would like the drag ski your skis would, with you and break your leg on the way. It would, that was the intent. Most of the time it would release and uh, prevent uh, any injury. Okay, and today, how many ski instructors uh, are at Wilmot Mountain? Oh, there's roughly about 200 ski instructors right now, both part-time and full-time. Okay. About how many are full-time? Oh, I would say probably probably about 20% are full-time all, okay. all during the week. But the big crowds hit on weekends, and that's where you need a lot of part-time instructors. Is there a, enough room for all these instructors to be teaching at one time? Obviously, not all 200, but... Uh, Even as many as 50. Uh, I would say that on a, on a weekend, let's say a Saturday, there may be 50 or 60 there. And then another group of a different group, maybe 50 or 60 the following day. So they're not all there at all one time, yeah. but they have different times when they're supposed to work. Okay. And when was the first time that you actually started skiing on the hill? I started in 1972. And me and my wife were teaching at Four Lakes Ski Area at the time. And then by 1976, uh, we just noted that Wilmot had much better terrain than the Four Lakes Ski Hill. And consequently, we joined the ski school. Okay. They also had a ski patrol out there. I guess most hills, well, every hill probably had a ski patrol. When did the ski patrol start and how did it grow at Wilmot Mountain? Well, it started back in uh, 1938. And that was... Uh, Walter Stopa, who was the first ski patrol member. And then uh, in the 40s, the ski patrol became uh, a member of the national ski patrol system. And then finally, uh, uh, the first ski patrol director was in 1950, that was Ed Morrison. And it grew uh, through the 60s. And in the 60s, the, um, the ski patrol was uh, awarded a, a, a very coveted award by the National Ski Patrol System for making a, a essentially a 16 millimeter film of how to take people off the hill, how to care for them, how to run the toboggans and things of this nature, which was uh, quite a training thing for the National Ski Patrol System. 
And then in 1966, the Ski Patrol received an Outstanding Ski Patrol Award from the National Ski Patrol System. So we started with a very few members, one initially, and then a few later on. How has the Ski Patrol grown over time? Oh, it's grown, and by the, uh, <clears throat> I would say by the 70s, we had over 200 members there. And um, the Ski Patrol directors at the 70s was, were Bob Revenar, Bill Nostrum, Doug Talbert, Jerry Fowler, and Mike Nolan. How many ski patrol members would be at the hill on any given day? I would say probably uh, about 30 to 40 percent on Saturdays and Sundays, and maybe 20 percent or so during the week so, because of the uh, of the different uh, timing of people show up. Okay. We were very busy on weekends, but not as much during the week. So. With the number of ski patrol members they have on site at any given time, about how many people could they actually deal with who might become injured? Oh, I would say that um, uh, one or two ski patrol members could handle one person injured if, if they had to. Usually, uh, if one person was injured, there'd be three or four there. But if there were a lot of them got injured, then I'd say the minimum would be one or two members. So they had plenty of people for uh, whatever number of injuries they could expect to have. Oh, yes, they, they had plenty. Okay. Um, can you tell me how the ski patrols changed over time? Since uh, I don't know exactly how you would help someone back in 1939. Well, they, they started with, um, with uh, different toboggans and then finally standardized a toboggan. And as uh, things developed at Wilmont, uh, they started using snowmobiles more to tow the toboggans. And then uh, there's, there were different techniques and different training depending on how you would ride a um, toboggan. In the older days, you would often use a snowplow to bring a toboggan down. Now it's more of a side slip. And there's training. And also the patrol system has a lot of training manuals that help develop of the ski patrol at Wilmont. And How often did these uh, ski patrol members need to update or upgrade their training? It would be periodic, but um, they uh, there'd be required training periodically by the association if you wanted to maintain your status as a as a certified patroller. And in in, in this day, 19, uh, 2022, the ski patrol uses snowmobiles. They use a snowmobile to, uh, to tow or, or the toboggans or get up there as quickly as possible. They have the radio communications and, and everything like that. So it's, it's, it's fairly advanced. Do, do they have anybody um, of particular talent in first aid or more treatment on site? Oh, many of them are, are trained in that and that's part of their certification process. And some are ac actually doctors. Okay, so you have a, a long list of ski instructors. You have great development of um, the ski patrol. And as we get into the, the 80s on the hill, they develop something additional to skiing? Well, in the, in the 80s, um, there was a, uh, a lawsuit brought against Stratton Mountain, Vermont. A skier fell, was injured, and sued the ski area and won. Well, this caused uh, plaintiff attorneys to come out of the woodwork, and uh, Wilmont was hit with a lot of lawsuits at that time. I remember that uh, our attorney, Mike Wilk, who was a judge before he passed away, but he was a judge in Kenosha County, was our attorney. Mike Reese represented the Hill. He was the new CEO. And I acted as the expert in skiing. And we went through about five or six trials and won them all. And luckily in time, the uh, state of Wisconsin came up with ski, uh, skiing safety statutes that limited the liability of the ski area. And that's when the uh, NSAA came up with the skiers responsibility code. So that essentially the statute said that if 
that uh, skiing is, has inherent risks. And if you fall down, you can't really sue the ski area for that. Okay. What else uh, happened in the 80s? Now, I know you talked about different methods of, of skiing, and uh, I guess that's mostly in development of more chairlifts and number of runs. Was there something else that uh, was added? Well, let's see. The, um, uh, what happened was the, uh, the ski patrol was actually practicing avalanche training on some of the steeper slopes. And uh, the ski school had over 200 members. And that snowboarding started uh, during that time. And I remember I was at an ASTM meeting and met uh, uh, a Mr. Carpenter. Uh, that's uh, Jake Burton Carpenter, the guy that essentially makes made Burton snowboards. And he sold me a snowboard for half price and I tried it out. It, it was difficult, but uh, people did it. It was like surfing. So I showed it to Mike Reese, the head of Wilmot, and they were sort of dubious about this. They thought it possibly could be unsafe, but the neighboring ski hill the following year, Alpine Valley allowed snowboarding and it turned out very well. So the following year, we had snowboarding and I taught one of the first snowboard lessons. I'm not sure it was the first, but nevertheless, I had a snowboard and I was the guy that had to teach snowboarding. Okay, so um, did they initially install a half pipe or try to do that for snowboarders? As, as snowboarding developed, they decided to try developing a half pipe. They had a half pipe dragon, which is a device that makes the the dished part of the half pipe. And uh, it turned out to be okay, but after a while it was too expensive to maintain. And they decided to get rid of that in lieu of terrain parks, which had jumps, rails, and boxes and things of that nature. Around the Midwest, half pipes are very difficult to maintain and there's very few. Out West you can do it, but in the Midwest where you have rain and snow at the same time, it's very hard to sculpture such a big uh, piece of the hill all the time and maintain it. So uh, initially, you mentioned these terrain parks with rails and jumps. Was it initially <laughs> intended for snowboarding use or was it for both skiers and snowboarders? It was initially intended for snowboarders, but the skiers liked it too. So now it's used both by skiers and snowboarders. And of course, at the ski school, we teach usage of the terrain park in both skiing and snowboarding. So is it pretty popular to use those terrain parks? Oh, very much so. Um, that uh, is an essential part. Many areas, as soon as they open up, try to get at least a small terrain park going because in the Midwest, we don't have very steep hills, but nevertheless, if you have a terrain park, you have the right slope and you usually do one hit on a small uh, area anyway, and you walk up or take the next chair up and hit it again. Okay, so are these these rails and jumps, are they made of snow or are they some other material? Uh, the jumps are made of snow. That's called a contact feature. These things are features. Rails are made of steel, and they're very much like the rails you see in skateboarding. And then the boxes are often made of steel or plywood with a plastic deck on top. And so there's various things you can do on these various tricks that snowboarders and skiers do. However, there is the Park Smart program, Park Smart, which means uh, people are educated and told at the beginning before entering a train park that they should know what they're doing and don't try anything crazy the first time you go in. And you look at them, take it easy, maybe take a lesson and learn how to do it. Are uh, protective head equipment required at any of the uh, parts of Wilmot, whether the park or the ski runs or anything like that? Well, ever since the helmets became very nice and light and weight, they are required for skiing now at Wilmot. Okay. Snowboarders as well have to wear something? Everybody has to wear a helmet. Okay. So into the, uh, you said Vail and Associates took over, bought the hill in 2016. And how has the new ownership 
been as far as the continuation of Wilmot Mountain? Well, it was uh, a little bit of a change for us people that have been there. In the past, we knew the owner and you'd talk to the owner and say, Here, we'll, here's what we're going to do today. And that was fine. Mm -hmm. uh, now with the Vale Associates with um, over 40,000 people or 50,000, whatever it is, uh, there's a lot of rules you have to follow. And so consequently, you have to follow them, make sure you have the right uniform on and things like that, the right attire, grooming and things of this nature. Uh, however, they did uh, put in uh, two magic carpets that replaced the old rope toes, which was excellent. That really helped in the teaching. People could go up the magic carpet, which is like an escalator, and it works out very well with teaching. They also upgraded the chairlifts and upgraded the dining facility and things of that nature. So they uh, were able to put a, a fair amount of money into it to do upgrades, which had not occurred prior to them owning it because of the, of the nature of having uh, a, a, you know, a private owner. With Vail Associates owning several ski areas around the world and the country, if you had a bad year at one end and a good year at the other end, it evened out. And so you, there'd still be money available. But if you were a single entity, if you had a bad year, it was tough. Did they have someone on site all the time? Like, do they have a, a manager who was an employee of Ale and Associates specifically? And could you go to that person or? Yes, they have, they have a manager, a general manager, and then they have a, a hill manager. And then they also have a guest services manager that handles the, the ski school and other parts of the operation, such as the dining room and things of that nature. Right. So back to your actual uh, involvement with the ski hill, you and your wife uh, taught beginning in 76. And do you both still do it today? Yes, we do. Okay. And I assume that skiing has different levels of instruction. Do you do certain ones? Do you do all of them? Does your wife do them all? I do most of them, except some of the, the advanced terrain features. Features, I don't do the rails anymore because when you get to my age, when you fall on a rail, it hurts all over. And so consequently, some of the younger guys teach that. But we both teach uh, beginning uh, uh, skiing, intermediate advanced skiing, and also beginning an intermediate terrain park. Now we touched on some of the challenges that ski hills in the Midwest uh, have to deal with, uh, especially weather. And you mentioned liabilities and uh, different methods of skiing that happen over time. Can you tell me about some of the technology, uh, even beyond the uh, ski equipment that has occurred that has made Wilmot Mountain an attractive and viable enterprise? Well, in the early days, um, there were the uh, snow guns and the sprinklers, and you had to get out there with a lot of people to smooth it off. But then as things developed and the snow guns became better, uh, there were tractors that had developed and you could tow uh, an apparatus behind it and smooth out the snow. And then there were auger systems put in on some of the other later models, which we have now, that really chews up the snow and makes it very nice to ski on. And with the new uh, airless snow cannons they have, uh, it puts out an awful lot of snow uh, for the price. So it, uh, these are the, some of the latest things that, that have occurred at Wilmot. The snow cannons, uh, the airless snow guns, and the grooming with the, uh, with the auger groomers has really helped. Okay. How difficult it, is it to groom a skill hill, a ski hill? The, uh, well, the tractor operator has to get up and then uh, uh, drive up and down the hill. He has to be very careful about not sliding too much or running into something. But that is done prior to it opening. And so it's, uh, it's like mowing the lawn in a way, only you have a roughly a 12 foot wide uh, auger in back and it goes up and down and it chews up the snow and makes it nice and fluffy and uh, so you can edge properly. So do they do this every day? 
Yes. Every day. And with 12 runs, I imagine it takes quite a long time. They're in there all the time doing it. And um, it's usually done in the morning or the past evening okay. after closure. How do you see the future of skiing, snowboarding? Well, it's um, it certainly uh, has leveled off a little bit in the past years, mostly for the because of the expense. Ski equipment and snowboard equipment is very expensive. But there's a lot of demand for getting out and exercising and having fun in the mountains or outside, especially in the terrain parks. I It's hard to say what's going to happen in the future unless there's some big development that the changes one way to, but I imagine it'll it'll tend to grow uh, slightly, but it won't be like some of the early years where it grew something like 30 or 40 percent in one year. You mentioned how expensive it is. Could you tell me, first of all, to outfit a skier, how what kind of expense are we talking about? And then when you get into the the expense of buying your lift ticket or whatever, how where do we call you know, how does that work? Well, basically, the um, uh, if you really uh, get online and go to some houses, you could probably be the out, outfit a snowboard setup for maybe around three hundred dollars. Ski equipment maybe a little more than that. Uh, if you're uh, a avid skier, the chances are you're going to be putting out maybe eight eight hundred to fifteen hundred dollars, you know, for ski equipment, depending on boots. Some boots are eight hundred bucks. Some skis are. 600 and the bindings and all the other stuff that goes with it. Well, if you go to a ski hill on the average of, let's say, once a week, um, what's your cost to use the hill? Generally? Oh, it, it, it depends on the time of day or anything, but uh, anywhere from 30 to 50 bucks, depending on uh, what kind of deal you can get. Best thing to do is get a season's pass many times, and that may be uh, up, you know, seven hundred to a thousand dollars, and that means you ski for free for the rest of the year if you have the pass. Do you have any interesting stories of your time as a ski instructor? Something that you well, came across, or something that happened to you? Well, there's been a lot of a lot of stories over the years. One one that comes to mind is that I had a a class of about six kids, and we were out skiing, and usually you demonstrate to them what you want them to do. So I said, okay, you guys stop here and I'm gonna ski down and do what I do. So I skied down, made some turns and unfortunately I caught my edge and fell down. Uh, it was embarrassing, but all the kids came right down, skied next to me and fell down right next to me and laughed their butts off and we had a good time. And, and what then do you I, Pardon? I, also, I also taught the ambassador from Israel how to ski. And there's many other important people that Helmut Teichner seemed to always know that would come. And uh, one of us would have to teach them how to ski. Was it interesting talking to them afterwards or during the time oh. or? Yeah, it was interesting talking a little bit of shop, but most of the time they were uh, learning the ins and outs of skiing, especially, you know, if they, if they are not very athletic. Although I had a, gentleman show up for a snowboard lesson who was 75 years old and he did very well he was a runner very athletic and he snowboarded very well and he didn't fall on a rail and hurt himself all over well we don't do that the first time out <laughs> rails and boxes and train park are usually for the advanced snowboarders oh, but oh, he handled the hill very well oh, good what is the best part for you uh in in teaching skiing Oh, but, uh, mostly be, me and my wife get out and it um, flushes my mind from what I do during the week. And I get out here and uh, it's, it's fun skiing. I happen to like skiing. I like the exercise. It's nice teaching the people how to do it. I meet a lot of good instructors that are very interesting to talk with and who help my skiing and snowboarding out quite a bit. And so it's, it's a good group. The pay, eh, it's not really that much but it'll, do you do it for the money no it, this is like community service okay okay well thank you so much for joining me today to talk about wilmot mountain and your uh, ski instruction days that still are going on you and your wife thank you thank you very much all right so long